Welcome to LasmoCast. I'm Ben Good, and today we will be exploring the classification of the largest macro-predatory shark of all time. This video is brought to you by OnPointFossils.com, piecing together the past one specimen at a time. The infamous Megalodon was a fierce predator that swam Earth's oceans throughout the Miocene and became extinct in the Pliocene approximately 3.6 million years ago. With teeth exceeding 7 inches in length, this was a massive animal that has typically been estimated to reach between 50 and 65 feet in length. But what exactly was Megalodon? Megalodon belongs to the Lomniforms, which is an order of shark commonly referred to as the mackerel sharks. Extant members include the goblin shark, the megamouth, and the great white. In fact, Megalodon was initially placed within the great white's genus Carcharodon. Since its initial placement within the genus Carcharodon, Megalodon has undergone several revisions in classification, including Carcharocles, Procarcharodon, Megasalacus, and Ototus. But which is the valid genus for Megalodon? Firstly, let's look at why Megalodon does not belong within the genus Carcharodon. While both sharks are considered to be large lamniforms, granted one is a lot larger than the other, and both have evolved serrated teeth, these similarities aren't enough to combat the vast differences within their dentitions. The Great White lineage can be traced back to the Paleocene with the genus Isurolamna. Older than that, the evolution of this lineage becomes murkier. Significant differences within these two lineages' dentitions include the possession of some physial teeth, which are the teeth that are within the center of the jaw which is commonly referred to as the symphysis. These are present within Cretolamna and other sharks within the evolution of Megalodon. However, these teeth are not present in Carcharodon and its ancestors, nor are they typically found in other sharks within the family Lamnidae. There was a Russian publication released in 1988 by L.S. Glickman and V.N. Dolganov on the discovery of some physial teeth present in a salmon shark specimen, which does belong within the family Lomnidae. I've not been able to find access to this publication in the making of this video, and the vast majority of species' jaws don't have the presence of this tooth position within the Great White's family Lomnidae, so I can't really specify if this is an atavistic, meaning an ancestral trait that reemerged after a period of dormancy, if it's a mutation, or if it's something else, but I figured it's worth noting. Another key difference is the significantly reduced intermediate position tooth that sits between the anterior and lateral tooth positions, which is present in the oldest known ancestors of the Great White, and this upper third anterior position is still present in the Great White's closest relatives, the Mako sharks, while other Cretaceous sharks, such as Cretaxirhina, have reduced intermediate teeth, as do some modern mackerel sharks like the sand tiger. The megalodon's ancestors in the genus Cretolamna, which go all the way back to the early Cretaceous, do not possess this trait. Presence of some physial teeth and the lack of a highly reduced intermediate position tooth suggests a fairly distant relationship between megalodon and the great whites. While the great white has this reduced position, that was plesiomorphic or ancestral to its family, it is far less reduced than its relatives and Paleocene ancestors, which may be attributed to its macropredatory lifestyle, pursuing larger prey at a higher trophic level, meaning it sits higher up on the food chain. A fundamental basis for the inclusion of Megalodon into the Great White's genus Carcharodon was the presence of serrations on both teeth. Serrations begin to develop within the Megalodon lineage in the early Eocene, with transitional forms preserved detailing the evolution of a serrated crown. The Great White Shark, however, develops serrations in the Miocene when Carcharodon hystalis begins to serrate in the Pacific, evolving into the transitional form Carcharodon hubli, before eventually becoming the shark that we all know and love today. So what does this mean? Serrations on both lineages evolved due to convergence, and don't bear any solid foundation for linking the two taxa together. Evolution of serrations is common within the fossil record of lamniforms, 
You have genera such as Paleocarcharodon, Carcharoides, and even the Thresher Sharks within the genus Alopius, among others, have all evolved serrations independently of each other. Okay, so now we know that Megalodon isn't directly related to the Great White, and isn't even within the same family as them. So what is it? To find out, let's refer to some basic taxonomic principles. Seniority of description is a hallmark of taxonomic classification. Procarcharodon was created by Edgar Cassier in 1960 to correct the classification issues of Megalodon's lineage. This is invalid due to it being a junior synonym of Carcharicles, which was described previously by David Starr Jordan and Harold Hannibal in 1923 to separate its lineage. The genus Megasalacus was a split proposed by Russian paleontologist L.S. Glickman in 1964 to separate Megalodon and its direct ancestor, Chubitensis, from the rest of the lineage due to a reduction and eventual loss of lateral cusplets. Since the development of serrations within Megalodon's ancestors, it is clear that the lineage is a chronospecies, which essentially means it's one species that has evolved into a new species through uniform changes over time without splitting off into separate lineages. For this reason, Megasalacus being separated taxonomically from the rest of the lineage is not necessary nor a valid split. Many paleontologists question the necessity of a separate genus being used to describe the serrated Carcharicles and the ancestral unserrated genus Otodus. Because Otodus obliquus is known to be the direct ancestor within the Megalodon lineage, Otodus a genus erected by the famous natural scientist Louis Agassiz in 1838 is currently the most widely accepted genus for Megalodon. Now, before we get too comfortable with Otodus Megalodon, there is still convincing reasoning for the use of the name Carcharicles. Let me explain, and later I will reveal my final thoughts as to which genus I think is most valid. If following modern taxonomic principles that focus on monophily, which is an ancestral taxa plus all of its descendants, Otodus would be paraphyletic, which is an ancestor plus some, but not all of its descendants. If the genus is used for just the Megalodon lineage, but not for the lineage of Peritotus, and possibly for the elusive genus Megalolamna both of which may have derived from Otodus. Otodus obliquus can only be included in the chronospecies of Megalodon if it doesn't split off into other lineages. Yet in the early Eocene, we see both the emergence of Peritotus, as well as teeth serrating into a lineage separate from the Peritotus lineage, indicating a divergence of Otodus obliquus into different taxa. Modern taxonomic principles would state that all lineages would be bound by the same genus, Otodus, which would include the lineages of Megalodon, Peritotus, and possibly Megalolamna, or that each diverged lineage would be given its own genus, both of which will maintain monophily. See, the issue isn't that Otodus obliquus was the ancestor to the Megalodon lineage, because all evidence indicates that it was, but more so, the issue is with modern taxonomy. Paraphily, which is a single ancestor in some but not all of its descendants, can exist in nature and is actually quite common. Think about what must happen for speciation to occur. Individuals from an ancestral species may evolve new traits and those traits get passed on to their offspring. This doesn't happen overnight for most animals. And instead, speciation may occur while the ancestral species is still present. Sometimes, geographical isolation of a population may result in more rapid speciation, while the less constrained populations may still be around and evolve more gradually. This can often complicate taxonomy and classification structures. For example, Reptilia is a paraphile, as it doesn't include the birds, which share the same common ancestor as the stem for reptiles. Fish are also paraphyletic, as we don't typically refer to tetrapods, such as our own species Homo sapiens, as a fish, as any clade containing fish as a whole also contains the tetrapods. 
For better or for worse, these common groups aren't true clades. It must be stated that unjustified paraphily should be corrected when possible. An example of paraphily in the Megalodon lineage is with the genus Cretolamna. Paleocene Cretolamna would be paraphyletic as it coexisted with a diverged taxa, Paleocarcharodon and Ototus, without it, the ancestral taxa becoming extinct. There was one lineage that gave rise to Ototus that was a Cretolamna, but then you have all of these other Cretolamna species that didn't evolve into Ototus or something else. Which means that if you have one Cretolamna that splits into an Ototus, but everything else is Cretolamna, then you have a classic case of an unnatural paraphile. And are the differences between Cretolamna and the unserrated Ototus species enough to warrant a genus change? Cretolamna consists of a slew of described and undescribed species, most of which have been distinguished by their isolated teeth. With such variation and high species level diversity, separating Ototus and Paleocarcharodon from that genus may be questionable. It would essentially take lumping everything from the family Otodontidae, with the exception of the possible sister genus Eucretolamna, Kinolamna, into the genus Cretolamna to support a monophyletic clade, or taking into account that Ototus was described well before Cretolamna was, that Ototus would be considered a senior synonym and would thus encompass all of Cretolamna, Peritotus, Paleocarcharodon, Megalolamna, and what is currently considered to be Ototus, along with Megalodon's lineage. In this case, Ototus would, in fact, be the best genus placement for Megalodon. But with that said, should we lump all of these taxa into one united genus? Does it really make the most sense to do that? While Ototus and Cretolamna may not have significant morphological differences in tooth design, the descendants certainly did. If we were to look at Paleocarcharodon, which, with its heavily serrated crown that evolved in the Paleocene as a sister taxa to Ototus, it would make a lot of sense to keep Cretolamna and use Ototus to comprise of, at minimum, the unserrated species within the genus currently described. And even if this weren't the case, because the teeth of sharks like Paratotus and Megalodon were so significantly different from Cretolamna, it would still make sense to keep Ototus for those currently described unserrated teeth. And again, because these Ototus descendants are so different based on tooth morphology, it would make sense, in my opinion, to separate these lineages by placing them into different genera. I would use Carcharicles to differentiate the lineage that derived from Ototus obliquus, marked by the earliest instances of serrations appearing on the cusp splits, as that marks the beginning of a chrono species that does lead to Megalodon and doesn't diverge into different offshoots. I would then retain the genera Peritotus and Megalolamna. While certainly not perfect, this would maintain monophyly from Ototus onwards and thus reduces an unnecessary paraphyle, even though it retains a paraphyle within the genus Critolamna. What I'm trying to get at is that both Ototus and Carcharicles are not necessarily invalid as there are arguments for both. This is why I still say Carcharicles Megalodon even when much of the world has moved on to Ototus Megalodon. I hope this helps. Now what are your thoughts on the classification of Megalodon? Please let us know in the comments below and don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you never miss a video.